Hello, my name is Keith Frankish. Welcome to this series of lectures on the illusionist view of consciousness. This is the first lecture, which I've called the illusionist option. I'll begin by saying a few words about myself. I'm an honorary reader in philosophy at the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom, and I also have affiliations with the Open University in the UK and the University of Crete, where I teach on the Brain and Mind program run by the Faculty of Medicine. My main research interest is in consciousness, but I also have interests in other areas of philosophy of mind, including the nature of belief, mental architecture, dual process theories of reasoning, aspects of AI, and, uh, and other topics. If you want to find out more about me and my work, you can uh, visit my website at www.keithfrankish.com, and you can also follow me on Twitter. Uh, here's a photograph of me taken during the 2014 Consciousness Cruise off Greenland, organised by the Moscow Centre for Consciousness Studies. Uh, here I am on board the, the sailing vessel, the Rembrandt, uh, playing the word game Frigate Bird with Nicholas Humphrey and Daniel Dennett. And they were much better at it than I was. OK, now... I'll begin by describing the plan of the lectures. This is the first lecture, and this will be an introductory one. I will introduce the problem of phenomenal consciousness and sketch the illus illusionist response to it. I won't be arguing for illusionism here. I'll just be trying to outline what the position is. Um, then in the next lecture, we will look at the case against qualia. Uh, I'll explain in this lecture what qualia are, here we'll be looking at some reasons for rejecting the realist view of, of, uh, of phenomenal consciousness, which illusionism opposes. So this will be the case against the opposing view, if you like. Then in the third lecture, I will develop the case, the positive case, for illusionism. Um, I will develop um, the illusionist position in more detail, I'll set out the illusionist position in more detail, and I will provide some arguments, some positive arguments for it. Then in lecture four, I will turn to some objections to illusionism. Plenty of objections to it. Some, I think, uh, good objections, some less good, some which I think uh, stem from a misunderstanding of what illusionism claims. We will look at these objections in lecture four and assess them. Then in lecture five, we will discuss some varieties of illusionism. Illusionism is a broad program, a broad framework for thinking about consciousness, and within that framework there are many different specific theories that could be developed. And in this lecture we'll get into some of this detail and look at the different options for an illusionist um, theorist, the different sorts of, of, of theories that could be developed under the illusionist banner. And then in the final lecture, we will look at some implications of illusionism or ask what implications, if any, illusionism has. Some people think that illusionism has some pretty pessimistic, uh, negative implications. Uh, and we'll be asking whether that's true. We'll be thinking about such issues as animal consciousness, non-human animal consciousness, artificial intelligence, and the basis for ethical concern. What, if anything, does illusionism uh, imply for these uh, topics? Right, so that's the, the plan of the lectures. Now, to begin with, I want, I want, to, in, I want to begin with this, this quotation from Galen Strawson, who is a professor of philosophy at the University of Texas. Um, professor Strawson doesn't like uh, illusionism, and he thinks it's, a, as he says here, the, a, a very silly view. Here, here's um, the quotation. There occurred in the 20th century the most remarkable episode in the whole history of ideas, the whole history of human thought. A number of thinkers denied the existence of something we know with certainty to exist. They denied the existence of consciousness, a conscious experience, the subjective qualitative character of experience, the phenomenal or phenomenological what it is like of experience. And Strawson calls this the denial and he describes it as the silliest view ever held in the history of human thought. And he adds a few, the names of a few people who have 
um, endorse the denial. Now, I, I, I don't mention this here to, to, to make fun of this view um, or in a spirit of self-deprecation. I, I think there's a perspective from which um, illusionism does look very silly. And I think it's important for the illusionist to understand that, to take account of that and to explain it, to explain why their view seems so silly to some very, very smart people. But I think there's another perspective from which illusionism looks very sensible. Uh, indeed, there's a perspective from which it looks like, as Daniel Dennett puts it, the obvious default theory of consciousness. So my aim here is to try to get you to adopt that perspective, at least to, to appreciate that perspective, even if you don't um, decide to endorse it. So I agree that there's a way of thinking about consciousness from which illusionism looks very silly. My aim is to argue that it's not the only way of looking at it. And if by the end of these lectures I can get you to agree that there is another way of looking at consciousness, then, um, then I, will have, I will feel I've succeeded, even if you don't, in the end, endorse that way. Okay. I'm going to begin with a little story. The Old Woman and the Beetle. Okay. So you're in, you're visiting a country you've never been to before, and you're in a busy city in this country. You're in the market, let us say. And you're wandering around. And an old woman approaches you. And she's wearing a brightly coloured dress. And she holds out to you a, a box, an open box like that. And she, she asks you to take it. And you're intrigued. And you, you, you take the box and, and, and look at it. It's just a plain wooden box. It has a little hole in the lid. You can't see this here in this picture. And it also has a clasp to close it with. Now the woman tells you to inspect the box carefully. And you do that. And then she says, close it and fasten the clasp on the box. Okay, so you think, well, okay, I'll go along with this. You do that. And now she tells you to hold it tight to your chest. And she makes some movements with her arms, gestures, waves her, her arms around, and she utters a, an incantation, something like a spell, perhaps, in a language you don't understand. And then she tells you, without opening the box, to look through the peephole in the top. Okay, so you do that. And my goodness, there inside the box you see a brilliant a huge, brilliantly coloured beetle. Rather like that. It's beautiful, shining, iridescent, multicoloured. You're amazed. How did that get in there? How did the beetle get in there? Now the woman tells you to hold the box again tightly to your chest and she again repeats the movements in the incantation. And then she tells you to open the clasp and, ha and, and, and look inside the box. And you do, and the box is completely empty. There's nothing there. No beetle. And the woman waits patiently for a tip. Uh, that little story is inspired by a famous passage in uh, Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigations. He, he doesn't tell the story about the old woman, but the beetle in a box is an example he uses. Um, I, I, you might like to check that out for yourself. Now, suppose that happened to you. What would you think? What would you make of what had happened? Well, you'd have, broadly speaking, three options. You might say it was a miracle. Uh, there really was a beetle in the box. Somehow a, this, a beetle got into this closed, empty box. Somehow... The, a beetle magically appeared in there and then disappeared. And the explanation for this must be supernatural. The, the woman must have had paranormal powers of some kind. She could do real magic. Or you might say, well, I'm convinced the beetle was real. There really was a beetle in there. I saw it for myself. But it, it, 
there must have been some some natural explanation of it. Uh, there must have been some hidden mechanism somehow that I didn't see that that inserted the beetle and then removed it through a little trapdoor or something like that in the bottom of the box. And maybe the gestures that the woman made were to conceal this this mechanism and and to activate it or something like that. So the beetle was certainly real, but the explanation of how it got in there and how it got out again is 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 natural. There's a a natural explanation for it. Or third, you might say, that was an illusion. There wasn't really a beetle in the box at all. The beetle was illusory. The box was empty all the time. It just seemed to me that there was a beetle in there. And the explanation for this illusion is, is a natural one. There was some setup of, I don't know, mirrors or holograms or something that made it seem like that, that, that there was a beetle there. And the first two options here are what we may call realist options. They're, they're beetle realist options. Okay. So the view that, that on those two options, you agree that there really was a beetle in the box. The third option is an illusionist option. It says, no, there wasn't a beetle in the box. There just seemed to be one. And the first option is what we might call a radical option in that it involves going beyond the kinds of explanations that we're accustomed to, particularly in, in science. It involves positing new supernatural powers or forces or entities or something of that sort. It involves radical revision of the ordinary scientific picture of the world. Whereas the other two options are conservative. They say that the explanation was natural, that it could be that what happened could be explained in ordinary scientific terms. Maybe some very complicated mechanisms were involved in getting the beetle in there or creating the illusion of the beetle, but there was nothing uh, that goes beyond the kind of forces and properties and processes and entities that science recognizes. Okay. So that's that's a little story to, to start us off. We'll we'll come back to it at the end, and I, I think you'll see how it applies to consciousness. Okay, well, let's move on to consciousness itself then. I want to begin by stressing that illusionism isn't the claim that consciousness isn't real. Illusionists do deny, do reject a certain conception of consciousness. So they do say that consciousness, as certain people conceive of it, isn't real. Um, but they don't say that consciousness in an ordinary, everyday sense isn't real. And so let me begin by saying what this ordinary, everyday sense is the sense in which illusionists are quite happy to say that consciousness and conscious experience are perfectly real. Okay, so when you attend to an object perceptually, when you look at something attentively, or listen to a sound attentively, or smell something, or taste something with attention, you focus on it, then you're having then you have a conscious experience of the thing you're attending to. So here, as you look at this apple, and attend to it and focus on it, you're having a conscious experience, or rather this image of an apple, I perhaps should say. You're having a conscious experience uh, of the redness and the shininess and so on. And during conscious experience, your senses provide you, or perhaps we might say your brain, with information about the object you're attending to. So in this case, your, your eyes and your visual system are providing you with information about the color and the size and the shape and the distance and the texture of the apple, or the image of the apple. Uh, and as well as uh, attending, uh, as well as having experiences of things in the world around us, we can also we also have experiences of the state of our own body, of events in our own body. So, if I ask you to uh, 
attend to what you are feeling in the lower part of your left leg right now. You might find that you're aware of a, say, a stiffness or an achiness or a strain or some discomfort or an itchiness or something like that. And if you do, then you're having a conscious experience of those things. And again, the experience is providing you with information, information about the condition of your, of your leg, of the muscles or the skin or whatever. Some interesting things about conscious experience. You can tell conscious experiences, you can tell introspectively when you're having one. That is to say, you don't need to work out that you're having a conscious experience by observing your behavior or any signs and uh, indications that you give, uh, as you would need to uh, do to say, uh, tell what your blood pressure is. You can't just tell introspectively what your blood pressure is. You have to to notice the signs, um, feeling flushed or whatever, or take a test. With conscious experience, you can just tell straight off that you're having one. If you ask yourself, am I having a conscious experience of, or what am I having a conscious experience of right now? The answer just comes to you immediately. It, uh, doubtless there are processes involved in your brain in bringing it to you immediately, but you don't have to do anything to work it out. At a conscious level, it just comes to you automatically, it seems. And that is, uh, uh, that is sometimes called introspection. You can sort of look inwards, introspect, and see what's going on in your own mind, as it were. And introspection of this sort provides you with information about your experiences and enables you to compare them with each other to say that, for instance, this experience of the colour of the apple is, is somewhat like the experience of seeing a, a post box or a fire engine and a bit like the experience of seeing an orange, but very different from the experience, say, of, of seeing a clear sky. Uh, it enables you to recall you're able to recall uh, experiences and to describe them, say whether they were pleasant or unpleasant and so on. You have a, a lot of information about your own experiences that comes through introspection. Now, I take it all that is uncontroversial. I think there's, uh, there's nothing there that a, an illusionist would want to deny. Now, we can contrast conscious experiences like that with what we might call non-conscious experiences. Now, you might think that the notion of non-conscious experience is contradictory, that experiences are conscious by their very nature. Well, that's a common way of using the term, but we can certainly, that we can certainly identify episodes that are like experiences, like conscious experiences in some ways, but aren't conscious. What I mean is that there are episodes where our senses provide us with information about the world or about our own bodies without our having a, a, an associated conscious experience. Now the clearest example of this is what's called subliminal perception and this is something that's fairly easy to demonstrate in experimental settings. It goes something like this, an experimenter will flash an image in front of the subject's eyes for a very short period of time, for a fraction of a second. If they get the timing right, the subject will say that they didn't, have, they didn't see it. They didn't have a conscious experience of it at all. But still their visual system will have taken in some information about it, enough to affect their subsequent reactions. And you can show this by testing the subject later. So, for example, if you flash an image of a camera before a person's eyes, just for a fraction of a second so that they don't consciously see it, but then later give them a word test where they have to complete a word beginning with the letter C-A-M, so they will tend to choose camera rather than any other word, rather than say camel. Whereas if you had flashed an image of a camel before their eyes again without them seeing it, they without them consciously seeing it, they would uh, tend to go for camel. So, at some level, the image had been registered and information about it extracted and uh, was available to affect 
and it affected the, the subject's res later responses, even though they didn't have a conscious experience of, of the image. So there's a kind of unconscious, non-conscious perception, non-conscious seeing, if you like. Another very striking example is uh, blind sight, which is a, a condition where uh, a person has had has suffered damage to the vis to part of their visual cortex uh, uh, in the, in the brain. Their eyes are still functioning normally, and so are, are parts of their visual system, other parts of their visual system. But the damage is such that for a large area, for an area of their visual field, the subject seems to be completely blind. They say they just can't see anything in that region. Um, Nevertheless, we can show that they are, it can be shown that they are still receiving some information. Their brain is still receiving some information about what's in that region. As I said, their eyes are still working and other parts of their visual system are still working. So if you ask, if you present to them an image of a, of a line, say that is either horizontal or vertical, and ask them which it is, they will say they can't see it. But then if you ask them to guess whether it's horizontal or vertical, they'll tend to guess right. And uh, this can, uh, the information from the, the, the blind region can also um, um, guide their, their, their responses. So if you throw a ball to them in that area, they will tend to, to catch it uh, instinctively. Again, guided by information that is getting through, that, is, um, that their visual system is receiving and that is making available to certain other systems without their having any conscious experience of it. Okay. Um, another perhaps more uh, contentious example is what is unconscious driving or unconscious performance of any routine activity. If there's, some, if there's an activity you're very practiced at, um, you can often um, perform it without attending very much to what you're doing. I think we've all had this experience of, of, of driving, if you're a driver, um, while you're thinking about something else, perhaps, or having a conversation, and not really attending to what you're doing. Nevertheless, you're driving perfectly well. And clearly, your, your eyes are taking in information about the road, and it's being used to control your, your, the, the movements of, the, of your hands and uh, uh, of your feet and so on. Now, whether this really is does involve... Uh, uh, whether the visual experiences here are really unconscious or not, it's difficult to say. But we do have this experience often of sort of coming to and finding that we really don't have any recollection of, of, of the last few miles um, that we drove. So again, here's something like a kind of unconscious experience, even if it's not fully uh, unconscious. So this gives us a way of defining consciousness in a kind of neutral way. We can say that consciousness is whatever it is that makes the difference between something like subliminal perception or blindsight that really is not conscious and attentive perception of the sort when you're looking at the apple, say, or attending to your leg. And I think we can all agree that, in this sense, consciousness is real. There's, there's a difference here, and it, we, it's, it's a real difference, and we need to explain what it is. Though it should be added, it may not be just one thing. There may be lots of different processes that are involved in, in conscious, uh, fully conscious experience. Now, I spoke there about conscious experience providing you with information. Okay, so that's... Uh, talking about a function of conscious experience, what it does, what it's for. Let's think a little bit more about this. Uh, here's a very, uh, a very simplified picture of what happens when you have a conscious experience and what functions conscious experience performs. So it starts with receptor cells in your sense organs reacting to physical stimuli. Uh, in the case of vision, the uh, photosensitive cells in the retina of your eye fire in response to uh, light of different wavelengths hitting them. Different cells react to different um, wavelengths of light. In the case of other sense, or other sense organs respond to other features, uh, pressure waves in the air, for example, or to uh, chemical compounds in, uh, in the food you're, you're eating, and so on. Then electrochemical signals travel along various routes to your brain, and their sensory regions, dedicated sensory regions, process these signals. 
um, there are specialized areas for detecting specific features such as edges and colors and so on and these uh, process it. This processing uh, occurs in a hierarchical way with more and more complex rep uh, representations being constructed so that you can, beginning with detecting simple features and uh, resulting in your detecting, uh, your brain detecting specific objects and faces and so on. Then attention, mechanisms of attention select some of this information for uh, to be shared widely with other brain systems, to be globally broadcast, as that's the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, phrase that's commonly used here. So this uh, information that's targeted by attention that, that seems to be important is shared with systems for memory, emotion, reasoning, language, enabling you to, to report the information, uh, motor control, and so on. So this information gets to have a lot of influence within uh, within the brain, and these systems then generate a vast array of of reactions. Uh, so some of this some of this may involve overt reactions, behavior, um, but the bulk of these reactions will be internal psychological ones, changes in uh, the, uh, new memories being formed, associations being activated, um, uh, and a vast array of changes to in your internal dispositions to react to future stimuli. So the, the reactions to one round of, of stimulation will subtly adjust in hugely complex ways how you will respond to the next round. So we can think of this as a cyclical process. Information comes in, is processed, is globally broadcast, generates a huge range of reactions, subtle changes to internal state that then shape how the next round of information is processed, the next um, the, the reactions that are generated to the next round of information. So it's a continual engagement with your environment, active engagement with your environment, information and reaction, cycling round. Now, all of this is immensely complex. It involves interactions among billions, literally billions of brain cells. And we still have only the sketchiest idea of what is happening or how it is, is being done. Still, none of it looks miraculous. We can divide it all up into various tasks that the brain is doing, detecting certain features, uh, sharing information about these features, using this information to produce reactions of various kinds, and so on. We can break it all down into tasks. We can describe it as the brain doing things, performing functions. And when we're talking about functions, we're talking about things that we kind of know how to explain. There's no deep mystery about how the brain performs various functions. We just have to find mechanisms in the brain to explain how it performs, and we just have to find mechanisms in the brain which, which do the right work, which implement the function, mechanisms that perform the task. So to take an example, here's, here's um, uh, uh, think about a television set, an old-fashioned cathode ray uh, television set. Now this performs a function, the function of converting incoming radio waves, which I guess come in at, uh, at, at the back here, at number 13, the, the, the screen is at the front, at the back here in this, and uh, the, um, the back of the television is at the front of the picture. Um, so it performs the function of converting incoming radio waves into a moving picture shown on the screen at the back. How, how does it do that? How does it perform that function? Well, um, very roughly, it's something like this. The signal is converted into a stream of electrons, which is um, number two in the diagram. Uh, the stream of electrons is 
distorted, warped by an electromagnetic coil, uh, number one in the diagram, so that it scans across the screen from top to bottom. Now the screen itself is coated with phosphor dots and wherever the stream, the, 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 the stream of electrons hits a phosphor dot, the dot glows. Now the stream is being modulated by the signal so it's like little pulses, so it's all sort of I guess on and off. It's being made to sweep across the screen by the electromagnet. Where it hits a phosphor dot, the dot glows. Where it doesn't, it doesn't glow. In colour televisions there are different uh, dots for producing different colours. And again, where one is hit, it produces that colour and glows in that, that colour and so on. The beam sweeps down across the television, producing a kind of uh, a still image. Then flicks back up to the top again under the control of the magnet and sweeps across again, producing an updated image. Again, all, con all modulated by the signal. And the effect of this is actually not to produce a moving picture, but to produce a series of still pictures on the screen which the human eye perceives as a moving picture. In order to get the full explanation here, we'd have to talk about how the human visual system works as well. So once we have that general picture, we've you know, we kind of explained in outline how the, the television does its job. Of course, we then have to explain how the magnets and the uh, does its job and how the uh, electron, how the radio signal is converted into a uh, electron stream and so on, but again, that's another function that we you know, we uh, step down a level and explain that function in terms of uh, more basic mechanisms. And once we understand the mechanisms, really, there's no mystery left. We've, we understand how it works. Now, for a long time, it was thought that this approach could only go so far when it comes to explaining human behaviour. Uh, Descartes, for example, thought that this kind of approach, this sort of mechanistic approach, could uh, explain a lot of human behavior, and in fact all of non-human animal behavior, that we were just machines that were performing certain functions. But there were parts of human behavior, he thought, that couldn't be explained in this way, and these were the, the intellectual parts of thinking, reasoning, uh, uh, intelligent language use. He thought he couldn't see how they could be mechanically produced in this way. And that was uh, why he thought that there was there must be an immaterial soul that did these things, some non um, non physical component. But we now have a very different perspective on this, thanks in large part to the, dis the development of computing theory in uh, in the mid twentieth century. Um, computing theory showed us how you could mechanize. Uh, informational processes, reasoning processes. Um, and again, simplifying greatly, here, here's, here's the idea. A computer contains symbols. They're, these are just physical states um, which stand for or represent things in the world. Now these symbols are nothing special at all. They're, they're not pictures of the world. They're, they're, they're they, they are simply, they might simply be combinations of strings of ones and zeros stored in memory, ultimately just settings of switches on or off, if you like. Nothing very fancy at all. And the machine manipulates these symbols. It's programmed, it's instructed to manipulate these symbols according to formal rules. By formal rules, I mean they're rules that are defined over the physical properties of the symbol. So it, it's programmed so that when it gets a certain combination, a certain combination of symbols and another combination, then it produces a third combination. Okay, so it might be something like that. When those first two patterns are activated, those first two symbol patterns are activated, the machine produces the third one. Now the crucial point about this is the computer has no idea at all what these symbols mean. It's just churning out sequences according to some rules it's been given. Nevertheless, if these processes mirror relations between the things the symbols represent, then they will implement reasoning processes. So suppose that pattern of symbols there represented states of the world. So the first pattern represented the fact that all men are mortal, the second one represented the fact that Socrates is a man, 
and the third represented the conclusion that Socrates is mortal. Now, if the, the computer did this and would do it with similar patterns of symbols that represented other, uh, say, Plato being a man or whatever, and come to and produce a symbol representing Plato being mortal and so on, then, so if it did this systematically, the the, the computer that would be implementing a reasoning process. It would be taking certain inputs and producing outputs that were logical conclusions from the inputs given the interpretation. Um, of course, this all depends on getting the symbols to match up with states of the world. Okay, uh, So we've got to have symbols that represent things like men and mortality or whatever and can be recombined to express things like all men being mortal. And the general idea here is, again, you can do this by having making the symbols causally sensitive to states of the world. So perhaps you hook up the computer to some kind of sensor that can detect features of the world and produces symbols that stand for those features. So maybe you hook up your computer to say to an animal, to a detector for animals. It can detect different kinds of animals. It's a uh, a video camera with simple sort of processing, uh, visual processing mechanisms that can detect different kind of animals. And then when it detects, uh, let's say, a dog, it sends a signal to the uh, computer which activates its dog symbol, which again is just a combination of ones and zeros. And then suppose when it gets the dog signal, the computer is instructed to activate another sort of, um, uh, to, to consult another um, system which produces a symbol that represents the time of day it is. Okay, so let's say this, this other system produces another symbol which again is produced, let's say, by a clock, so it's sensitive to the actual time. And if this symbol, say, says that it's, I don't know, let's say four o'clock, which is feeding time, so it's got the dog symbol activated, it's got the four o'clock symbol activated, then it has an instruction when those two symbols are activated to produce another symbol that then triggers a feeding mechanism for the dog. Let's see, the, on the output side, the computer is hooked up to a dog feeding mechanism. So here, th there are symbols that represent dogs, symbols that represent time, and a symbol that represents an instruction for feeding. And the computer manipulates these symbols according to rules that it's been programmed with, without any idea of what it's doing, but still producing reactions that are appropriate to the inputs. It's being sensitive to the presence of dogs, sensitive to the feeding time, and producing feeding behavior. So this shows, in principle, how minds could be mechanized. The idea is that this sort of stuff could be going on behind the scenes in producing our intelligent behavior. I mean, think about when you're having a conversation with somebody. You rarely consciously think up the words. The words are coming to you spontaneously. But hopefully, if you're, if you're doing well in the conversation, they will be appropriate words. They will be rational responses to what's being said to you. Some mechanisms must be selecting these responses and activating the words. And maybe this is something like this kind of computation, computational process going on in your brain. It's not one you're aware of. Your brain, as, uh, your brain itself doesn't understand the words. Your brain is, produce, is performing computations that produce words that make sense in the context. Because that's how it's been trained up to do. That's what it's been trained up to do. Now, I'm not suggesting your brain really is a computer in that sense. But what this, uh, uh, the idea then is that mental states like beliefs and so on could just be symbol structures like this and that mental processes could be just computations over them, reasoning could just be computations over them, all at an unconscious level. Now, as I said, I'm not supposing, I'm not suggesting your mind really does work that way. But this does provide a kind of model of how a mind, how mental processes, how information processing could be done mechanically. So it takes away the deep mystery that Descartes thought there was over intellectual processes, over reasoning processes and thinking processes and intelligent language production and so on. So even if that's not, ex not 
right, it, it kind of is enough to make it not seem miraculous. Maybe the story is going to be, I'm sure the story is going to be much more complicated and so on, but still it could be some sort of causal story like that of how these functions are performed. Okay. So insofar as consciousness involves these kind of information processing activities and the reactions that go with them, uh, explaining them is <laughs> relatively easy. It's not, there's, there isn't a deep uh, mystery here about these. It's a project we can start to work on. And this, however, contrasts with an aspect of consciousness that seems very different. And this is what David Chalmers has called the hard problem of consciousness, in contrast with the easy problems of explaining the various functions involved. So let's say a little bit about this. Okay, so here's the picture. All of these functions we've been talking about, the information processing, the reactions, all of those those processes are, are real and important and uh, uh, we couldn't survive and function without them. But they're not sufficient for consciousness. Consciousness is something extra over and above all those informational and reactive processes. Now, what is it? It's awareness of the feel of the experience, a sort of mental quality that goes along with the experience. The quality of seeing red, hearing uh, a musical note, feeling uh, a fabric, uh, having a pain in your in your leg. The immediate quality of the experience, what it is like to have the experience. And somehow the brain, as well as processing all the information and producing all these reactions, generates these mental qualities that make the experience like something for you the idea. And these qualities, as I said, are distinct from the information received. Various terms are used for these qualities, qualia, which really means qualities, phenomenal properties, subjective feels, what it is likenesses, and so on. Sometimes these words are used with different meanings. I, I won't distinguish them now. I'm just l using them all as um, as um, uh, uh, labels for this this feel of experience. Uh, gen uh, general terms that are used for this um, this this um, uh, kind of consciousness are phenomenality, the presence of these qualities, and phenomenal consciousness, the kind of consciousness that's constituted by having these by being aware of these these properties as opposed to what we might call informational consciousness or access consciousness. Um, and this is a term, uh, phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness are terms introduced by Ned Block. Um, access consciousness is just uh, 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 information about uh, perceptual information, sensory information being made accessible to other brain systems, being globally broadcast. It's a, a functional um, condition, um, whereas phenomenal consciousness is the sort of consciousness that involves this, this inner, um, this uh, awareness of these um, fields, these qualia, these phenomenal properties. Now here's a quote from, a uh, quotation from David Chalmers, um, which uh, helps to define the hard problem. When we think and perceive, there is a whir of information processing, what we were talking about, but there is also a subjective aspect. Uh, the thought here is that the information processing is uh, an objective phenomenon. It could be studied and completely um, described by neuroscientists. They could track all the processes in the brain, all the mechanisms, and understand them just as we could understand the, uh, all the processes inside a television. The 
qualitative aspect of experience, the phenomenal aspect of experience, on the other hand, is subjective. It's private. It's just for me, the subject. As Nagel, that's Thomas Nagel, has put it, there is something it is like to be a conscious organism. This subjective aspect is experience. Uh, note that Chalmers here is using experience to mean the, the, phenomenal, uh, the phenomenal consciousness, phenomenality. When we see, for example, we experience visual sensations, the felt quality of redness, the experience of dark and light, the quality of depth in a visual field. So again, this isn't just getting information about uh, colours and dark, um, dark and light and depth and so on. It's the feel of these things. Now these properties, these qualia, these phenomenal properties are special. Uh, there's no complete agreement about their, their, um, their features, but here are some things that are often said about them. They're often said to be ineffable. You can't describe them directly. You can say, well, it's the feel I get when I look at a, at a, at a, at a ripe apple. You can say it's the feel you get when you look at something red. You can say that it's a feel that is more like that, uh, that is closer to that of, of, of uh, orange than to that of blue, say. But how do you describe redness in itself? Suppose you're talking to someone who is uh, blind or colorblind and who has never uh, experienced colors. How would you characterize what redness is like in itself, the pure feel of redness? supposed to be ineffable, in, uh, in uh, describable, in, Intrinsic. Um, the idea here is that, 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 that these properties are not constituted by relations to anything else. In particular, they're not functional properties. It's not um, having um, experience having the feel of red isn't a matter of it's doing something, having certain effects, carrying out certain, uh, performing certain functions. It's a matter of what it's like in itself, the, the pure feel of it, the essence of it. Uh, they're said to be known directly and with certainty. The idea here is that, uh, well, you could doubt that uh, there really is an apple out there. You could doubt that there's an external world at all. Maybe you're in a computer simulation, uh, as in the, the, the Matrix. But you, So you could doubt that the information that your sensors are providing you is accurate, but you can't doubt the feels. They can't doubt the qualities that are mentally pre immediately presented to you uh, uh, mentally, inwardly. Uh, and, you, and your knowledge of these things doesn't seem to be mediated by any kind of mechanism. I mean, if it were, then the mechanism could go wrong and you could doubt whether it were, um, or whether the properties were really as they seem to be. But in the case of, of these, these properties, th there seems to be no distance between you and them of that kind. This is how, these are how the world seems to you. The apple seems red to you, and that seeming itself is immediately and certainly um, presented to you. They're also said to be, often said to be, private or subjective. The idea here is that no one else can observe them. The neuroscientists investigating your brain, they could map all the information, all processes in, in principle, all the reactive processes, but they couldn't um, detect your the quality of your experience. Indeed, we can't be sure what the quality of other people's experiences is like. Maybe you, when you look at a, at a red apple, you have quite a different uh, experience from me. We, we both agree that the apple is red. We both agree that it re reflects light of a certain wavelength. Um, we both agree that it's the same color as pillar boxes and fire engines and so on. But what mental quality is it producing in each of us? How could we know? It's the one produced by red things, but what's that? Um, really, red things, are, red things, as scientists describe them, don't really have qualities like this. Red things are just things that reflect light of certain wavelengths. The redness, it seems, is in our minds, and we can't know what other people's rednesses are like. And... Uh, it follows from this that these, these properties are distinct from the worldly properties they're associated with. The apple is red in the sense that it reflects light of a certain wavelength. Um, but that's different from what, uh, what's sometimes been called reddishness, the, the quality of the experience uh, that red things produce. Um, 
and uh, my reddishness might be very different from your reddishness. So here's a little diagram representing that here. The two people have different um, different experiences, different qualia when they look at something yellow. Both agree that these uh, these experiences are experiences of something that is that has the worldly property of yellow that represents light of whatever wavelength yellow things um, uh, reflect. But their private experiences are very different. How could we know? Now this creates these phenomenality, these phenomenal properties, create the hard problem of consciousness. And that is simply how does the brain produce these phenomenal properties? This isn't a matter of explaining any of the abilities or reactions that go along with experience. How does the brain produce the taste of coffee, let us say. This isn't the problem of how the brain discriminates coffee from other drinks, how it uh, enables us to describe the coffee, um, perhaps in great detail, how it produces all the other reactions we might have to coffee, liking it, disliking it, the memories, the associations that it calls up, um, and so on and so forth. It's none of that. All of that could be explained functionally in the way we described earlier. No, the hard problem is explaining the pure feel of the experience, the feel of the coffee taste, the feel of seeing red, the feel of the pain. And this, as we've just seen, can't, this is an intrinsic property, one that can't be characterized in terms of function. It's the pure essence of the experience, the pure what it is like of the experience. And there are several well-known thought experiments that kind of buttress the idea that there's a hard problem here. One is the well-known case of Mary, the um, scientist who is brought up in a, enclosed in a black and white, totally monochrome black and white environment. And she, Mary, studies all the physical details of color vision. So she knows everything about what the brain is doing when, um, when we have color experiences. She knows all the details, all the information processing and the reactions that are produced down to the finest detail. She lives in the future when vision science is complete. But still, intuition goes, uh, she wouldn't know what it's like to see colors because that's something more, something extra. When she were to, If she were to leave her room, she would learn something when she first sees um, uh, colors. This uh, this uh, thought experiment was proposed by Frank Jackson uh, in a famous 1982 um, paper. Another thought experiment that's often used here is that of zombies, uh, one that David Chalmers in particular has promoted. A zombie is a creature that is physically identical to you. It has a brain of exactly the same structure and complexity as yours, which does exactly, performs all the same functions as yours, all the same information processing, generates all the same reactions. It just doesn't produce this world of phenomenal properties, this inner world of, of qualia. So there's nothing it's like to be a zombie. The, the inner lights are off, as it were. Now, you couldn't tell that somebody was a zombie. All their reactions would be exactly the same. They would even say that they were conscious. And neuroscientists couldn't tell any difference between them and us. But still, there would be this huge difference. It wouldn't be like anything to be them. Now, the thought is we can, we can imagine that. We can conceive of that. And that shows that these uh, phenomenal consciousness is something distinct from all the, the physical processes, all the functional processes. So then we have this hard problem. How does the brain work this magic of producing phenomenal properties? And so here's a, a quote, another quotation from, from Chalmers. Why is it that when our cognitive systems engage in visual and auditory information processing, we have visual or auditory experience? The quality of deep blue, the sensation of middle sea, 
how can we explain why there is something it is like to entertain a mental image or to experience an emotion? It is widely agreed that experience arises from a physical basis, but we have no good explanation of why and how it so arises. Why should physical processing give rise to a rich inner life at all? It seems objectively unreasonable that it should, and yet it does. If any problem qualifies as the problem of consciousness, it's this one. This is the hard problem. Okay, so it looks like we've got a sort of miracle here. And again, we've got three options. So we're picking up on the story about the, the old woman with the beetle box. First, we could say, well, yes, it really is a, a kind of miracle. Phenomenality is definitely real. There really is this inner world of mental qualities. But the explanation for it is, is non-physical. Um, what do I mean by non-physical here? Well, let's say I mean that it's one that can't be captured by the physical sciences or extensions of them as we currently conceive of them. It's something that goes beyond the kind of things that physics and chemistry and biology and cognitive science talk about. Okay, that will do. So maybe there is an explanation, but it's one that's going to go way beyond that, just as, say, supernatural powers would, um, positing supernatural, uh, attributing supernatural powers to the old lady would go beyond uh, our existing explanatory um, strategies. Second, we might say, no, well, no, it's, it's, it's real, all right. It's phenomena is definitely real. We can't deny that. But it's there, there really is a, a kind of mechanical explanation for it. Uh, there, there is a physical explanation. Cognitive science can uh, explain it. Maybe not at the moment, but in the future it will be able to. Um, maybe really it is just a matter of certain functions being performed, certain kinds of information processing, and that that will explain it. And third, we might say that phenomenality is an illusion. It's illusory. It's like the beetle in the box. And the explanation for the illusion is itself physical. We can explain how this illusion is created in physical terms, in terms of uh, information processing and, uh, and so on. So again, the first two options are realist. They say that phenomenality is real. It's definitely, there really is this inner world of, of these uh, private mental qualities. Um, and the third one is illusionist. The first option is radical, in that it proposes radical extensions to our existing science. It says that existing scientific projects can't, can't uh, deal with this. And the second two are conservative, in that they say that existing projects or extensions of them can explain this. Okay, well, I'll just say a few words about radical realism and conservative realism. I think it's fair to say that most philosophers of consciousness would uh, fall under one or other of these, uh, into one or other of these camps. And there are many uh, different positions within each camp. I mean, they're very broad um very broad groupings. I'll just say a few words. Uh, we could spend a whole course looking at uh, either of these positions. and um, But I'll just say a few words here um, to orient ourselves with regard to them. So radical realism, the most common version of this is property dualism. This is the idea that Phenomenal properties uh, are non-physical properties. They're roughly then not among the properties studied by the physical sciences. So the sort of catalogue of properties that the physical sciences are developing, the physics and chemistry and biology and cognitive science and so on, don't include these properties. Uh, we're going to have to extend our science in radical ways in order to, uh, to accommodate uh, consciousness, according to this view. Now, that this is property dualism, not substance dualism. The suggestion here isn't that um, that we have immaterial souls distinct from our bodies. It's that our brains have dual properties. They have the physical properties studied by uh, third-person science, and then they have these extra phenomenal properties. Now, the, the challenge for this view is really to explain how these phenomenal properties are related um, to physical ones. And in particular to explain um, 
what sort of causal role they have. It seems plausible to think that, it seems obvious that pains and pleasures and tastes and so on have an effect on us, have an effect on our behaviour. But if these, uh, if these properties are non-physical ones, then that's, that's, that becomes uh, a problem. Um, because it looks as if uh, science is going to be able to give an, a, an explanation for all changes in the physical world in physical terms. So everything, it, it's plausible to think that what, whatever happens in your brain will be, will be explicable in terms of previous states of your brain and of your body and of the environment and of the, the physical world generally. Uh, neuroscientists don't find things happening in the brain with no, with no physical cause, and similarly in uh, elsewhere in nature, it looks as if the physical world is closed under causation. That everything that happens has a sufficient causal, uh, a sufficient physical explanation. And if so, how do these phenomenal properties get into the picture? Now, one option is to say, well, that they they do somehow. Um, they, 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 they do have a causal influence, and uh, we, this has got to be, um, um, uh, we haven't yet uh, discovered exactly where it is or how it happens. Maybe it happens at some quantum level, something like that. We don't know. Another option is to simply accept that they don't have a causal influence, um, that they're epiphenomenal, that they're a kind of side effect of all the information processing and so on the brain is doing, um, and that it's really all the physical processes in the brain that are causing the effects and the reactions, uh, and that these this inner world of mental qualities just uh, sort of goes along for the ride. Um, we think it's causing the events, uh, that are reactions, because it always occurs just before them. So the pain occurs just before we shout, ow. Um, but it was actually, it wasn't actually the pain that made us uh, shout out. A third option that's receiving quite a lot of attention at the moment is panpsychism. Here the idea is that, that really all of the physical world has a phenomenal aspect to it. Its uh, phenomenal properties are not just restricted to our brains. That uh, elementary particles have a little bit of consciousness, a little sort of micro-consciousness. And that our uh, human consciousness is a, is a combination of the micro-consciousnesses of all the particles that... Um, that compose our brains or our bodies, and this sort of this view kind of ties in the phenomenal to the material to the physical much more tightly, and um, uh, its proponents think that um, that it can um, uh, account for our intuitions about uh, consciousness having a causal role. Um, the difficulty, of course, is that it it does involve supposing that consciousness is is much more widespread in uh, in the physical world than we than we have reason to think. Uh, here's a picture of David Chalmers, who, um, whose 1996 book, The, uh, the Conscious Mind, uh, uh, really uh, stimulated a lot of these radical realist research programs. Okay, the, the other main option is conservative realism, um, or we might call it physicalist realism. The idea here is that these, these phenomenal properties are really just physical properties. Uh, maybe just patterns of neuron firing in the brain, perhaps. Uh, they don't seem like it, but that's what they are. Okay, so all of these intuitions about their being non-physical and hard to explain and so on, they're misleading. But they're still real. The phenomenal properties are still quite real. There really is this inner world of, of mental feels, what it is like, this is, but they are just ordinary physical properties of the sort that a, that a neuroscientist could, in principle, uh, detect and observe. And so the task for uh, conservative realists is to explain away our intuitions about the non-physicality of phenomenal properties. Uh, the major strategy here is what's called the phenomenal concept strategy. The idea is that we ha have special ways of thinking about our own experiences that we apply introspectively and th that are very different from the ways we have of thinking about the ex uh, things in the external world physical things in the external world. And because of this difference of ways of thinking, we get misled into believing that there's a difference in the things we're thinking about. Okay, so we think about our experience in a very different way from the way we think about, say, you know, apples and uh, tables and chairs and things that 
and that this leads us into thinking that our experiences are something very different, belong to a, a very different kind of world, a non-physical world. Now, the major challenge for this view, I think, is to justify its realism. Conservative realists want to agree with the radical realists that these qualia, the, what it is likenesses, phenomenal properties, that they're real. They really are. They're, they're real. Um, and so they still have to address the hard problem and explain how the brain produces them. Whereas it seems that most of what they have to say is about explaining away our intuitions. It's about explaining our intuitions about them, why we think they're non-physical, why we think they're ineffable, why um, we think they can't be explained in physical terms and so on. Now, that's all very well, but there's a danger that it's going to slide into the view that phenomenal properties don't really exist, that our intuition that they exist can also, is also misleading, which will be to slide into what into illusionism. If they're to resist this slide, then conservative realists must say that must ex, must say that phenomenal properties are real in some meaty and substantial sense, a sense that is essentially the same as the sense in which radical realists claim they exist. And I think the challenge for conservative realists is to do that. One option for the uh, conservative realist here is to say that really they can't explain how um, these properties arise. They could say they are just physical properties. They're not something over and above the, the physical properties of the brain, but we can't really explain their existence. We can't show in the way that we could show with the television set how the properties of the brain amount to <laughs> phenomenal properties. We can't give that kind of reductive explanation. We can't show how what's happening in the brain is sufficient for these properties to exist. But still, they do exist, and they are just physical. Now, maybe that's a possible position, but I think it's a, a, a defeatist position in that it's giving up on the project of trying to explain consciousness. If you think that these properties are essential to consciousness and you think they can't be explained, then you can't explain consciousness. Okay. So this brings us finally to illusionism. As I said, I'm just going to sketch what the position is here. I'm not going to argue for it. I'm not going to try to make it sound particularly plausible. I'm just going to tell you what it is in outline. Again, like the other programs, it's a very broad, like the other positions, it's a very broad uh, group, grouping, and many different forms of illusionist theory could be developed. But here's the outline. Okay, so illusionism involves two basic claims. The first claim is that phenomenal properties do not exist. All this talk about phenomenality, about what it is likeness, about qualia, about subjective feels, this isn't picking out anything real. It might be confusedly picking out something else that is real, but it's not picking out anything like what it's supposed to be picking out. Those things, this inner world of qualia, doesn't exist. That's the first claim. I'll come to the second claim in a moment. Um, so illusionists will say that consciousness is a functional process, a wholly functional process. And that sensory information is conscious when it's, I mean, the illusionists might develop different, um, different accounts of the functions involved, but this is the default one that I'll assume for the sake of this, um, of these lectures. We'll get into some more details here in, in lecture um, uh, five. So the basic, the basic default position I'm going to assume is that sensory information is conscious when it is available 
to a wide range of control systems and generates a wide range of reactions, small and large, as we talked about earlier. That sort of global broadcast of information, that is what consciousness is. Daniel Dennett has spoken of this as informational influence or fame, fame in the brain. Uh, here's a, a quote, a quotation from him. Consciousness is cerebral celebrity. Nothing more and nothing less. Nothing more. Note. Those contents are conscious, that persevere, that monopolize resources long enough to achieve certain typical and symptomatic effects. Effects on memory, on the control of behavior, and so forth. Information becomes conscious in virtue of its effects. That's the difference between subliminal perception and attentive perception, conscious percept, conscious experience. In conscious experience, the information is having a much, much richer set of effects. Now the second claim. Phenomenal properties seem to exist in some sense of seem. Now you might immediately think, oh, but if they seem to exist, then they do exist because they're just seemings. If it seems that I'm in pain, then I am in pain. That's a very common objection to illusionism, and it's one we're going to talk a lot about. Here I'm just going to state this. Phenomenal properties in some sense seem to exist. In some sense of seem. I'll come back to all this later. Here's a quick sketch of why they seem to exist. As I said earlier, right at the beginning, we are, we can introspect. We are aware of our own experiences. We can describe them. We can recognize them, describe them, and react to them. We, get, we can introspect our experiences and acquire information about them. And this depends on mechanisms of introspection, just like our awareness of the world our, uh, depends on mechanisms of perception. We know about the apple because we have mechanisms of perception. We know about our experience of the apple because we have mechanisms of introspection. And these mechanisms monitor our experiences the, in the sense of the informational and reactive processes that I talked about. Introspection monitors those processes and supplies information about them to higher level control systems, so, such as language, so that we can report our experiences. And these higher level control systems then generate further reactions. So there's a dual kind of, there's a dual cyclical process here. There's the first process of perception, of information and reaction, which constitutes perception, and then there's a second one, a second cycle of information and reaction that constitutes introspection. So because of introspection, we don't just notice things in the world and react to things in the world. We notice our noticing. We notice that we're noticing things and we react to our reacting. And it's this that creates the illusion of a private inner world populated with mental qualities, with qualia. The idea here is that introspection is misleading. The information it provides is schematic and impressionistic. It delivers a partial and distorted view of the processes it's tracking, which are, of course, highly complex processes. This isn't a fault in introspection. We don't need to know all the gory detail of, of, um, uh, of what our brains are doing. We just need a kind of outline, a sketch, enough to enable us to recognize experiences, compare them, recall them, report them to other people, and so on. We don't, we don't, a sketch, a caricature, that's all we need. But it has a side effect. It creates a false impression about what it is that we're aware of. It creates the impression that our experiences have phenomenal properties. 
that there is this inner world of qualia, of subjective fields. That we have, that there is something going on over and above all the information processing and the reactions that it's um, that that uh, that it's generating. But this this is an illusion. The phenomenal the phenomenal properties are merely intentional objects. Intentional object is something that exists only as the object of of a belief or a representation. For example, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes exists only in our thoughts. Or unicorns, or Father Christmas. Um, we can talk about these things. They can play a useful role, perhaps. It's very interesting to read about Sherlock Holmes. Very entertaining. But he doesn't really exist. He exists only in our as a, an object of our thoughts. And so the phenomenal properties. That's the illusion in illusionism. Let's return to our story. The next day you're in the market again and you see the old woman. And you really want to know how she did the how she made the beetle appear in the box. So you approach her and you you offer her a large reward for telling you the secret. How did she do it? And she says, Well, it's it's quite simple really. There uh, there was never a beetle in the box. Um you see, I'm a hypnotist. And what I did was to, to hypnotize you into believing that you'd seen a beetle in the box. So you're puzzled. Is that right? Could she really have done that? What really happened when you when you looked through the peephole? Did you see anything at all? Did you just think you'd seen something? Can can a person really hypnotize you into believing you've seen something you haven't? Well, well you're going to have to think about this. Okay. So next time we will start to build the case for illusionism by looking at the case against phenomenal realism, against the view that qualia exist. And we'll be looking at some arguments from Dan Dennett in particular. Here's a photograph of Dan, from uh, again from the Greenland cruise in 2014. So, um, that's the end of this lecture, and I will see you again soon. Thanks for listening.